now I just like to let people know because I don't know who I was interviewing, and I was looking at some of your pictures like uh, on your website, like headshot wise, like Tiny Lister. That was cool. You got shots of him. There's a lot of familiar faces. How how'd you end up getting those people? Was that just from, did you work with any of them or you were just doing that out in LA? Word of mouth. Cause I'm a good cool. photographer and I'm easy to work with and I'm a good Sweet. laugh. I'm a good time. Nice. <laughs> so, and you know, um, Sean Hayes, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I saw that Emmy won. winner. Sean, yeah. I know, uh, Tony award winning now as of recently. Yep. Yeah. Wild. Yeah. Um, yeah, people, it's just, it was just, it's just word of mouth, you know, and, um, and it's, it's such a people thing, photographing someone and you've got to oh, be yeah. vain enough to know the pain of what it's like to be on the other side of the camera, to really take great care of them lighting and angle wise. And, and I, I painfully understand that other side. And I think that's, it's cool about when people do that. It's like, if somebody's running a restaurant, you hope they did all the jobs in the restaurant beforehand. So they know what the workers are doing. I think the same thing with you. Like, it's cool that you mentioned that, you know, you been on the other side, which is one thing. And then also like when you did a little bit of directing, like when you're directing someone, it's great. Right. Totally. Yeah. It's so funny. You said that I, I feel like every actor should direct a small film at some point in their career, because then they'll lay off themselves. They'll give themselves less of a hard time because like you don't realize that the director doesn't have time to coddle you so much because they have so many things on their plate and you just understand the big picture more. And I also think everyone should like wait tables for at least a month. So you understand oh, yeah. that profession. Yes. And you respect them when you go out to my mom is a waitress growing up. So I have like an extra amount of respect for people that no. do that. But uh, so, yeah, so we were talking about a little bit, so you grew up in New York City. What part? Um, well, I was born in Long Island. And nice. um, Beth, Beth Page, to be specific. And um, my mom and dad moved to Los Angeles when I was six. So I basically, from six years old on up, was raised in Los Angeles. I would go back to New York um, every summer until I was 19. And then I went to NYU Sweet. Um, when I was 20. And I majored at the Tisch School of the Arts, um, directing and photography, and uh, just did a, a year and a half there and um, took off to Italy for a bit, did some modeling in Milan, and then came back to Los Angeles, got a waitressing job, um, met my boyfriend there, who I've been married to ever since, and oh, wow. started <laughs> um, started acting, you know, was on like a little bit part on that soap opera called Santa Barbara. Okay. Ago, and um, was working with photographers as the, a makeup artist for extra cash in my early 20s and would deliver proof, uh, proof sheets to agencies. And the agencies would be like, hey, do you have an agent? Do you have an agent? So I was able to nice. get an agent by getting in the door. Um, yeah, I got myself this cool manager named Jay Bernstein, who had discovered Farrah Fawcett and... Uh, <sighs> Linda Evans and, and Suzanne Summers. And he did this whole talent search thing and he took me on and brought me the Willie Morris agency. And I started getting, you know, you, you get better scripts when you're with a better team. And, um, although better, I don't know what better means, but yeah. you know I mean. how'd you end up connecting with him? Was it just going around or you said he does like a star search? Is that how yeah. he found you? It, it was, um, I was in an acting class and the acting class got called because they needed interns and, um, you know, to answer the phone and they, they figured it would be nice to have actors. And so my acting teacher said, you know, you got to go, he's going to notice you. And I'm like, he likes blondes. They'll never pick me. And he's like, you're going or I'm kicking you out of the class or doubling your, your tuition. So I went and I answered phones and, um, and they did this talent search for like three weeks and they would give people callbacks and on one of the callbacks, the girl wasn't there. And so one of the, um, one of the judges like Sally Kirkland was a judge. Oh, um, nice. Robert Forrester, like some of these old Hollywood people that were friends of this manager. <laughs> and they brought me in to do a, a callback with this guy. And it was a scene from um, a Tennessee Williams play. 
And, and so I did the scene with the actor and then the actor left the room and I started to leave and they said, whoa, 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 intern, come back here. And they sat me down and they were like, so what did you think about that guy? And I'm like, oh, he was cool. He was cute. And they're like, no, but what did you, did you feel a connection? I'm like, I don't know. I felt he was a little nervous uh, around me. And they were like, excellent, excellent. We thought that too. Now tell us about yourself. Oh, wow. And anyway, and then as I left the room, um, a woman came out and she goes, we don't want you answering the phone anymore. You're in this race. So, um, so I wound up, it, it got narrowed down to me and two other guys and he repped us all and out of, I guess he saw, he saw like 2000 people, but he had about 10,000 submitted like in Hollywood story. Yeah. No, that's how they all are. Like from all the people I've interviewed, I've been doing this for like four and a half years now. No matter who, it's it's always something like that. It's never like, and and I think you know this from like from the beginning, like getting into this game, you and growing up around LA. I'm sure you talk to other people and you hear like, oh my god, it's so hard. Which it is. It's a hard thing to do, but that's the that's how you get it. It's never like, yeah, I wanted to be an actor and I just showed up and I got the job. There's always like something, the right place, the right moment, seizing an opportunity that you had. One question I have to have is. So what would your parents come out to L.A. for anything Hollywood related or just work sent them out here? My mom um, wanted to she actually wanted to be an actress. Right. Really? She wanted to be an artist. She wanted to just sort of leave. Um, she just felt like she was very too close to the family. She wanted to be independent. She wanted to be a, a, an actress, really. And wound up actually never uh never being able to get past the headshot session for nerves wow and um and then my parents got divorced within four years after moving here so she was a single mom raising two kids and um and my dad came back to new york and um <laughs> yeah so she um yeah and so i couldn't it was tough she couldn't take take me on auditions because it's an interesting thing you know you you actually have to be a little bit upper middle class to be a, a child actor. So when you see these kids on TV, it's rare that they're coming from broke ass families because yeah. you, and, and though the only reason I may take that back a bit is because now a lot of auditions can be done um, on video. Yeah. And, um, but like that's only in the last couple of years, but prior to that you have to drive and, and auditions come at, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. And if two parents are working their butt off, they can't stop and get in the car and drive from Burbank down to Santa Monica to audition their kid for a Taco Bell commercial. Yeah, yeah. Um, they don't just give it away and they don't just audition on the weekends. So it's a real, you've got to have a dedicate, the whole family has to be in on this. You know, your, your parents have to really be a part of it. And unfortunately my mom couldn't because she worked two jobs. So it wasn't until you know, I was one of those kids at 16 and a half, got my license, would drive her to work at her night job, and then I would have the car to do auditions with for myself. Wow. Now, I've, I've talked to people, I've talked to a few childs, so like Stanley Livingston, he was in stuff pretty young, and his whole family was acting, like his brother Barry ended up being on My Three Sons. He was oh, like wow. the fourth son. And then like Patrick Laberto. He was telling me his sister was uh, an actress. She was a little bit older than him. But he said, like, after school, other kids would be, like, going to be baseball or something. And he's like, my oh, mom's taking me to audition out in the middle of nowhere. It, it, it really <laughs> is. I mean, I, I yeah. brought my daughter into the business a bit. And, and it was such a nightmare because I'd pick her up from school, you know, and she's nine years old and we're in the car. And I'm like, I'm driving and I'm trying to put a barrette in her hair and she doesn't want it. <laughs> I'm trying to take the peanut butter out of the shirt and 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 you're on the freeway for two hours um and then you just want to do anything to make them happy at the end you want mcdonald's i know it's the antichrist but let's go to mcdonald's you know yeah, yeah. so the the um the kids have to really want it and the kids usually do you know i actually wrote something in the huffington post about quote unquote nice. stage moms and i wrote a whole whole article because i'd photographed so many uh so many actors and young actors and these kids they really want to do it and literally the parents the moment the kid says, I'm done, they'd be so happy to have their nights back at home with the rest of their family and not stuck on the freeway or helping the kid memorize lines. 
And, um, but they just get this bad name of stage mom. And I, I compared it to um, uh, Eli and Peyton Manning's dad and that no one would ever call Eli or Peyton Manning's dad a stage dad. But you know that dad had to apply some discipline to have not one but two boys oh, yeah. get a position that is the most coveted position like in the world. That that wasn't a dad saying, sleep in, here, have a Snickers, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like they're they're ha- but so that but the stage mom thing kind of became, you know, so but no, most just no, most of these kids, they, they really want to do it and then they, they can fizzle out on their own, but you do need a parent to, to help. And so I uh yeah, I don't know how we got on that, but there you go. Uh, uh, you you're talking about it with your mom wanting to be an actor. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's how you got out there. It's pretty that's pretty cool. Yeah, so it, from yeah, from no, you no, winning I, the I star it. search, so you, from you getting that and they say, "Hey, you know what? You're not answering phones anymore." Right. What was like the first step after that? Was it like doing commercials or were they putting you on to like auditions right away? Well, I had been going on auditions. And oh, I, okay. I had done, yeah, I had done um, that little part on Santa Barbara and that was, for oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Missions. I had an agent. Um, so I was going out on stuff, um, but it got elevated because then I went to the William Morris agency. So I just, you know, and I had to work with that manager to leave the other ones. I felt so bad. And he's like, look, it's, you know, it's show business. That's what it's called. It's called show business. It's going to be okay. You know, what does he like to drink? I'm like, what? What, you find out his favorite booze, you show up to his office, you tell him you love him, here's a hundred dollar <laughs> bottle of booze, and you move on. You know, you keep your nose as clean as you can, but it, it's it's a business. And, and um, you know, we can get very emotional and we want our team to be the coolest, nicest, but really you want your team to be the most effective and be with people whose phone calls get answered. Yeah. Um, and that's where he was bringing me and he really sort of taught me that. So yeah, it brought me to the William Morris agency. And I remembered, um, I met with the head of the agency. I forgot his name at this point, an old man, a lovely human. And this was like 1990, um, uh, 1992, just before I did subspecies. Um, and he, um, he had a, a headshot in his office of this budding, fantastic actress who just finished a film called Cape Fear named Juliette Lewis. Nice. And, um, and I know her and, um, and, and her, her father and, and her brother, they're just wacky and wonderful. And, um, and he just said, you know, like the, the, this is what we cultivate here at the, you know, um, anyway, they just, I, I was, I was alphabetically on the list between God, it was Donna Dixon <laughs> and, um, I'm trying to remember who else that the, my agent, um, you know, cause every agent has their staff but i remembered i was uh, i was just below donna dixon and above i forgot who the other actress was <laughs> anyway but julia lewis that's pretty cool I, you know sometimes especially with the internet nowadays i think we were watching yellow jackets and i went on her imdb or her wikipedia and then i saw a thing about her dad and i'm like oh, her dad's from new jersey he grew up he, i don't know if he was born in the same hospital as me but he was born in the same town i was born in but uh, yeah, that was like pretty amazing. Like he was like a Jersey guy, and then he went out there too. But uh, yeah. she's unreal. Like you really think about her, man. She's unreal, crazy good, and crazy. <laughs> she's one that you never heard about her being like a teen, wild, like being wild as a teen. But I watched this reunion with Christmas Vacation and uh, Jonathan Lipnicki. Not Jonathan Lipnicki. What's his name? Uh, Jonathan uh, Getz. The guy from how uh, uh, Big Bang Theory, Jonathan oh, Galecki. Galecki. There's like a mil- oh, yeah. yeah. There's like a million actors with that same kind of like cadence of their name. <laughs> but yeah, the name. <laughs> yeah, but Jonathan Galecki. He had during the reunion. This was probably only like ten years ago. He was like, yeah. While we were all going, while I was going to bed, she was going out to party with the crew, and she was uh-huh. like thirteen or fourteen at that time. Oh God, it's just a, an old soul in such oh, a, yeah. hippie, a hippie family. Yeah, very cool. So yeah, so so the like on your credits, Santa Barbara, because some reason they don't have them sometimes like that on IMDb. Oh, yeah. It doesn't work out. Like I think it's after a certain amount of time they're like, yeah, 
But yeah. the first one you have yeah. on here, like 91, if you say that around 91, 92 is when you started connecting with that guy, like yeah. everything took off like right away. Because all yeah. in that year, you have like Dream On, Northern Exposure, yeah. Reasonable Doubts, Martial Law 2. So like that's a busy year, right? It was busy. Sort of right out of the cool. gate. That was like, yeah. And, and you know, there's something about you um, uh, uh, by association of being with a good team, you know, and I, I can't say like, oh, I was the best actress for it. But somehow I also feel that I was with a good talent agency. So they know they, uh, they there's so many elements to get it, to hiring an actor and having them show up and having their team um, not screw you over and how your billing is going to go and the whole payment. And you're, it's not just you, like when you get hired, they're hiring, you know, your agent and your manager. And so, um, I just think that it's the, the more you're surrounded by a professional company that that's another point in your corner. Um, so it was, it was very cool to be with such a respectable team. And I remember at one point they, my agent said to me, um, or I think I said to him, I said, you know, why do you guys like me so much? Like, I'm not some superstar, you know? Um, oh, I know. Cause they, they wanted to take me to, to lunch, you know? And I'm like, well, wow, lunch <laughs> with me. And, um, and he, <laughs> said, he goes, you're available. You, you're a professional and you make yourself available. And I, and I remember thinking, well, who wouldn't, you know, cut to 15 years. My daughter's like, I've got a daughter. She's grown up. I'm busy. I, I now have a different agency and I find myself like, yeah, you've got an audition at Paramount for a CSI. And I'm like, oh, like I roll my eyes. Right. Yeah. Or, I've got this trip or, oh, I'm, I'm working on my roof or I'm redesigning my, you know. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I, I could then I start to go I'm like, oh, that's what these agents are talking about when I'd have to call and cancel last minute. And an agent puts in a lot of work to get you that audition. You know, yeah. they, they, they put all their professionalism on the line. They pitch, you know, she might be too pretty. No, trust me. She's earthy. <laughs> she's too young or she's too old. No, you know, they do their pitch. And when you get a yes and they call you to say, I got you an appointment and you're like, oh, I'm going to be seeing my kids school play. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I didn't have that for many years. And then it start life starts to creep in and, um, yeah, it becomes more of a juggling act. So, at least your excuses were because they were like legit. But there's obviously, I'm sure he had other actors and actresses that yeah. were not showing up because yeah. they were out too much or just wanted to yeah. go off the grid for a while. So, now that you have to be available. And then, w one thing when I've talked to like casting directors or even like even directors that use like the same a lot of the same actors, not even maybe not the main stars, but the behind people and casting directors do the same. They know like, Hey, you know what? Denise is going to show up. She's going to do what she needs to do. And we don't have yeah. to worry about anything. Cause that's the last thing like you direct it. That's the last yeah. thing you want to worry about is an, is an actor going to show up. They're going to oh like, do true. it. I, I hadn't thought of that until I got more into this. And there's so many moving parts that you can't, you know, when, when actors will be like, God, it's, there's such nepotism, you know, you'll see like Vince Vaughn or, you know, like whatever, like certain, or, or, um, you know, Ben Stiller or, uh, Will yeah. Ferrell, you'll see these like same gang of guys and it's like, they can trust them. And plus it's fun. It's fun to work with friends, yeah, you yeah. know, but, yeah. but there's, there's this trust factor in, in a team and, you know, you, you just, you got to get in there. And I, I, I tell actors that it's okay if you don't get the audition from that casting director, but do establish some sort of relationship. Don't just do the audition. Um, notice something like if it's on video like this, you know, like if you were an actor and I was auditioning you, I don't have much going on around me, but I do have a picture there of Haiti and yeah. And for you to bring up something about it would engage us in a conversation. And I would talk about when I went there to volunteer with the military and you would nice. like have something then cool. And then you'd be like, all right, Hey, thanks for the audition. Boom. And you might've said something like, Oh, you used to be in the military. And I'd be like, Oh my gosh, right. That's right. Doug. Wow. Doug was in the fucking military. Well, he yeah. wasn't in that part, but I got this, uh, you know, Yeah. So it's really, um, and, and once you get to audition for them several times, 
then you're 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 connected you know sometimes it's the kiss of death to to book the audition on the first time and you never really establish this relationship so i always like to you know inspire actors that it's okay if you didn't get it on the first one they're getting to know you you know and the more you're around that familiarness they get to see other angles of you and then they can go to bat for you so like auditioning wise do you remember like your early obviously you're doing all the audition, audition on your own but do you remember like the first time you landed like a role that you were like, Oh my God, I can, cause obviously you had a passion cause this is something you wanted to do, went to school for it, but I'm sure there's always like something in the back of your head until you are like, quote unquote, like being successful at it. Was it like getting like a movie like martial law two or like getting like, like subspecies? Well, the, those were super exciting. I mean, the, the first thing that I will say that the one, the, the one that's not credited, the Santa Barbara one yeah. was, did blow my mind because I did cool. have to go to NBC studios and I'd never gone in there. And I was like raised in California. And now here I am 22 years old and I'm driving in there. And it was, <laughs> you know, from a, uh, an audition from the paper, like not even an agent. So that wow. just blew my mind. And I was, I was so afraid <laughs> doing that role i replaced a girl who had left so they still had an episode or two and and i was like in a tennis um having lunch and i just finished playing tennis and i was this debutante and i'm and i'm holding um uh, a, a champagne glass <laughs> the champagne glass i was so scared it was shaking and and i have to t and i and i had to like oh like use it in the scene i i was literally <laughs> shaking because you're around it's worse on a soap opera because you're around these professionals and then of course years later i wind up getting on a soap opera and you just become yeah. that family member but when you're not the family member you know you're the outsider and um and it's your first job oh dry mouths all that <laughs> um, but boy when that thing aired every I'd say about 80% of Long Island saw that episode. That's cool. <laughs> because all my Italian friends, they made VHSs, they mailed them all around. <laughs> That's my really daughter, cool. My granddaughter, my granddaughter is an actress. I mean, it was fantastic. <laughs> I, that is one of the funnest parts is having excitable family members that get to just get so excited. Like I've done a lot of commercials and commercials are, are, almost even more fun. Well, they, they make more money. Um, yeah. but they, they catch you by surprise, right? You, like, I would always have friends saying, Oh, I went back East to, you know, for Christmas and I saw you on TV. It's usually when our friends are like leaving town or going, you know, I was in a hotel room and I turned the TV on and, and it's, it, it's fun to sort of surprise different friends <laughs> with your face yeah. on TV. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. I don't, yeah. um, but uh but the subspecies audition was like i really um i really went like acting class on that one i probably did things that you probably shouldn't do on a professional audition but i had already auditioned for a full moon film and you know i knew they were quirky and they yeah. weren't a big studio you know i had been, i'd go i'd gone to paramount and um let's see had i no, I hadn't auditioned yet for that. Um, what was it? Ro Robo, Robocop. What was the one? Um, um, Sylvester Stallone and, um, uh, oh, Sof uh, Demolition Man. Demolition or Man. Yeah. I still have nice. that script. I, I, um, I had a callback for that. Sandra Bullock got it, but, um, wow. uh, but I had read for that part and, um, but that was after subspecies. So anyway, so I'm reading for these kind of parts. And I knew that this one wasn't a huge studio. And somehow I just felt like that you could almost entertain the lower studios with, you could push it, the creativity a little bit more, you know? And um, so I brought a little, a little rock, like a, a little stone, a little bloodstone. <laughs> and, um, um, and I put some lipstick on the back of my neck and I, and I had this little stone and so I'm doing this scene and it's one of the scenes that, you know, I, with, um, um, I think my sister and you, you can't come and don't look at me. <laughs> and, um, uh, and then, then it's sort of one of the scenes and segues into Radu 
and um uh you know the the night is coming and and something and 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 I let him bite me and then I pull away and I see the blood and he says you must drink from the bloodstone and then I grab it and anyway so there was some action and to be honest you could feel like an idiot doing that in a room you're just standing there and there's three people sitting on a chair with their arms crossed and you're <laughs> To create this gothic world of make believe, you know, of a vamp. It's it's different than if it was, um, you know, honey, you cheated on me, and I want a divorce. Okay, I saw her underwear in the sheets. Her out. Like you could say that anywhere, you yeah. know. But this vampire world, it, you your head has to really be in it, you know. It's a little, a little next level make believe. So. Um, I put the the lipstick there, and when um, uh, I think an honors was actually in the room for the callback, and he came like so he walks close, and I just put my hand there, and when I pulled it away, it was all red, and I just wanted that little help for me to believe that I just got bit, and and yeah. um, and then the uh, the the this little stone which I had like in my pocket. Um, pull, and it was just a little crystal, you know, um, and it, it, it worked, it worked yeah. later. Um, so those little tiny things sometimes, um, in an audition, you know, you never bring guns, even I've even pointed, even if I point my finger, I never point it at the casting director. Yeah. 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 You know, like if it's something, <laughs> I don't even want to point my finger at someone because it's, yeah, yeah. you're right. You don't want that casting director to feel in any way threatened. Um, yeah. So, so with that audition was, was really fun to, um, to just at the very least, you know, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, you leave that room. And the only thing you've gained is an ability to entertain someone for five minutes. So, so 100% of the time you've got to make, that five minutes, extremely entertaining. Since that worked, did it make you like, even though you said like, maybe this, uh, this is something you could do with the lower studios. Did you ever try anything like that afterwards? Because that worked. You have, you have good questions. You have good questions. <laughs> um, Cause I love audition stories. Like one of my people that listen to the, to, to this podcast, I always, whenever I talk to auditions about uh, with, with actors or actresses, my favorite story ever, I'm sure you heard it, Danny DeVito, when he got a uh, taxi. Yeah, yeah he, he walked in. And he's like, who, who wrote this piece of shit? And he throws it down. <laughs> yeah, and he leaves. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I, like, those are, again, no matter what, even like you said before about the, the picture in the background, if you're doing like a Zoom for an audition or something, like even if they didn't like him for that role, because obviously he was made for, he was born for that role. Yeah. Like, but even if he wasn't, whatever um, next project that director or producer was working on, they yeah. would think of a role just to get him into it because 100%. just that story is unreal. Yeah. I, um, there was a, a casting director that said to me, um, he used to be my agent for many years at, at LA talent, mm -hmm. LA models. And then he, he's been a, a casting director. His name is Jeff Hardwick. And he said, you know, when I see an actor and after the reading is done, I only want to be thinking one of two things, either um, that was brilliant or what the fuck was that? He <laughs> said, but anything in the middle is forgettable. Yeah. It's just safe and forgettable. And, and that, that gave me a little more courage too. And that of course was after, um, not of course, but it was after the, uh, the vampire one. Cause I think he was one of them. He was my commercial agent at the time. Um, but it, 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 it uh, underscored the fact that you do have to do that. And you hear that all the time, make a strong choice, make a, gotta make a strong choice. What the fuck does a strong choice mean? Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, it, it, that's really the, the craft, the, the craft of an actor and a strong choice doesn't have to be loud and it doesn't have to have words. Um, it doesn't have to have any wavelength, you know, um, or it could have all of those, but, um, yeah, I am. I, um, I, I did a, an audition just a few weeks ago for a film that I did get called The Exorcists by um, Asylum. Oh. Um, by Asylum. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're good. And, yeah. Yeah. And um, 
and it's directed by um, a friend of mine. I, I, I was in one of his very first films. I don't even know if it's on my resume. It's called The Monster Man. And it might be on my IMDb. I think it is on there, yeah. Okay. He was 19 at the time. He's 42 now. Wow. And, and he was just this young kid. And I was in LA. He was in Florida. And he offered me like 2000 bucks to come out for the weekend. And I was like, sure. And it was the only time I ever did a non-union film. And there was just something about him. And so I did this little film and um, I had Conrad, what's his name? Oh my God, from Plan 9 from Outer Space. Conrad Brooks. Uh, maybe. <laughs> anyway, I think that might be it. Um, some screen <laughs> queen types. Um, and uh, Oh yeah, Linnea uh, uh, yes, Quigley's yes, in it, Linnea right? Quigley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, then like three years later, I um, or two years later, I wind up getting on Young and Restless and I'm on that. And then I, I get this opportunity to be in this film, but I decided to direct it and, and make it a uh, union. So, and that's where I hired Jeffrey Lewis in it and a bunch of my, you know, friends, actors, some people I met at conventions. And I had this guy, Jose Prendes, help me make the script a little more interesting. So he flew out and helped me do that. And then he wound up staying in LA and work like did some work with the Sharknado people and did sort of his own oh, little cool. shark film thing. And so now he just directed and and it has Doug Bradley Pinhead from cool. Yes. Yeah. So Doug Bradley stars in it. And um uh yeah, I star in it with him. And but so on That's the audition, awesome. it's a nun who turns into a demon and uh <sighs> So the first half was just the very nice nun audition. And then the second one where she was a demon. And so I do the audition. I, I, I text it to him for notes before I text it to the casting director. And um, I, I should probably read it. <laughs> um, <laughs> he said, uh, oh, God. Um, I mean, it's so far back. Oh, wait, let me say <laughs> this. You know, and, and this is a, as a, oh, I can show you. A, um, this is. Um, yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Just another night on That's frightening. Right, right? Yeah. So um, the film looks, we're in this great mausoleum. Don't mess with it. <laughs> <laughs> It's just fantastic locations. So um, we, um, oh yeah, and there's um, uh, Doug Bradley. He plays. Cool. He's awesome. Uh, eh, full of class. Um, but he said, I, he goes, I don't want you like, don't chew up the scenery so much. Um, what did he say? Um, don't chew. Can we talk tomorrow? Thank you. I think, oh, I had a question. Um <laughs> Oh, that's my flight. Yeah, I said, um, don't don't chew up the scenery so much. Um, think of think of Radu, um, but not not so much his voice. Um, oh my God! Wait, I couldn't find one extra. Oh God, it's for updates. Hold on. Oh, um, yeah. After I after I did the after I took his notes, he oh, sent nice. that. A little but Leo the, clap, clapping. The note like. was, okay, here it is. Can you redo uh, the crazy Caroline? Um, a bit more subtle, no accent. I didn't even know I was doing an accent. I'm still in <laughs> part five of subspecies. Uh, yeah. Quiet is creepier, not so broad, and mustache twirling. You see what I mean? That's he's <laughs> not so broad and mustache twirling. <laughs> And uh, he said, honestly, think Radu. Honestly, think Radu when he's quiet and menacing, but don't do his voice. Wow. Isn't that like, it was just, I just loved how specific he was. He could have kept out the mustache twirling, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then I did it and, you know, he's awesome. And that was what he said. Nice. So, and then I wound up, get, he had to send it through the producers. So, um, but that it's like you you and and you've got to go huge with it and and i'm glad because even on set i m made some bolder choices which he loved you know so you do have to be willing to ha to have uh, someone say y y you know 
you did too much. You, you were too much because there is nothing you can always bring it down, you know, and that's something that's a very theatrical thing of being able to bring it down. Um, yeah. So I think I did what my, what my casting director friend said, either what the fuck was that or that yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I know you have to be memorable, you know. No, I yeah. love audition. I would love like a documentary on that. Just have actors talk about auditions. I always forget that whenever I talk to people. But this one guy, uh, one quick story. This guy Gregory S. Cummings, big time character actor. He's been in a million things. He was recently on like Bosch. He's uh, Max Dad on Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and oh. uh, just he always plays a bad guy. He's a great bad guy. He's in Cliffhanger. He's one of uh, the henchmen of John Lithgow. But anyway, so he told me a fun thing he does, and I've never heard anybody mention this, and I've talked to other bad guys that interview for bad guy roles. He <laughs> takes out all the periods and the and the commas yeah. and the exclamation points because he knows that whoever uh, he's, he's going to read it for has heard somebody do that sort of cadence. So yeah. he says that he's like a ticking time bomb. And then he'll add things in in different points. He'll use the same words, but exactly how how he wants to put in the commas or the exclamation points. He told me funny stories. A very B movie, and it was opposite Robert Zadar. Uh, oh, I forget the name oh, of the movie. Oh, it's a really know. it was it was a really hard movie to find. It's from like nineteen ninety or ninety one. But anyway, Greg showed up to the audition and dressed two different ways. He did like his nice normal guy and then he did his slick back hair and he blacked up his, uh, his, uh, his goatee. Yeah. And he went under both two different names just so they wouldn't associate it with each other. And he got two different phone calls and he got the role for both parts, but then he had to tell them like, Hey, that's I'm, they're both Greg. So he ended up taking like the hero role. And then I think, Either Zadar got cast it or he was going to play Zadar's like henchman in the movie. But uh, that's a good segue wow. to, uh, to Dr. Spangle. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, no. Dr. It's Spangle. That, Dr. Spangle. Ugh. Oh, my gosh. So that, much fun. That director literally would give, there were a couple of the actors on the set. I feel most of them have passed away. Um, but uh, I think, let's see. No, Brian James. Maybe it was Brian James. Um, he had to... He would, he would give them line readings because a couple of the actors just didn't want to take the time to memorize anything. <laughs> and, um, and so the director literally would say, um, we've got to get out of here. And then the actor's like, we've got to get out of here. And then the <laughs> like, you know, the troops are coming. And then the actor's like, you know, the troops are coming. You know, and they do it their own way. And, um, but I just remembered sitting in these scenes and first I have to hear the director say the line to the to the actor and then i have to wait for the actor to say the line to me and and i had mine memorized and i was like this is amazing you know i just thought <laughs> oh is this what happens when you become an old time star you know <laughs> that are oh. the old like wearing the lines on your uh i forgot what big time actor it was or what scene it was but there's one that uh i think robert duvall wore the i think it was like uh yeah, not the Brando Godfather. Was it had, the Godfather? Yeah, as you say, Marlon Brando had like, yeah, he was not not good with the memorizing. He had things in his ear, you know, that yeah. little speakers. And <laughs> and in fact, someone, um, it was uh, Doug Bradley on this set told us a whole Brando story because there's a lot of big speeches in this uh, Exorcist movie, and one of yeah. um, one of the one of our co-stars, it was just speech after speech, and we were like, "Can we write them and put them in places and <laughs> schedule?" And and he said, he goes, "You know, the reason why uh, Brando would talk because he would he was pointing to where he was reading because they'd move the lines <laughs> and get the next thing, and it was it was more because of where the cards were." Uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's, I get yeah. why people do it. Like I've heard stories about Eric Roberts doing it, but he's getting flown out to do a movie and they're paying him to be there on set for a day. And then he's probably mm -hmm. flying the next day to go somewhere else. So I, I get it. If they write the lines on the wall or something, whatever you got to do to get the scene, like even this. And uh, I think the movie is so wild. And I think what's so great about it, it's very rare that the sequel can capture the campiness of the first one. Like The first <laughs> one obviously has Piper, 
No. Uh, but the second one is just so it's I think it, it, it jumps the shark even more like the songs, <laughs> the soundtrack in it, the song that is about like frogs. It has actual lines when the frogs are like driving down the road and you're like, what is going on? What's I don't fun? Even remember the music? I I don't think I've seen it since like 1997. <laughs> it's oh. free on YouTube, so you can check it out. But no, there is like on in the scenes. There's like a frog band in one scene with like all these frog I do people. Remember that. Yeah, <laughs> I remember then- it being. It was such a fun day on the Jeep. We were at like it was like the Paramount Western Ranch. Like we were at such a, you know. Uh, um, it was a set that that carried such clout of old time Hollywood class, and here <laughs> we were doing these froggy films, you know. And um, uh, what's his name? Um, Lou Ferrigno, sweetest, oh my God, yes, sweetest guy. I've got this picture of me doing his makeup. You know, he was the set matchmaker. He just wanted everyone to to be in love, you know. <laughs> So he would try and set up, okay, which makeup artist wasn't seeing someone and which lighting guy was single. And he's just was a darling to work with. That's awesome. How long does it, for a movie like that, like, I don't know what the budget was, but like how, like four weeks to shoot that whole movie? Oh, I think that movie was probably three weeks. Oh, okay. That was like three weeks. Um, the, the This Exorcists that we just did, um, was seven days and that crazy. was crazy crazy <laughs> the um uh, blood rise that we did in serbia um that was four weeks yeah so so you're kind of used to it so like the seven day thing maybe for not i don't want to use the term like regular actor that like somebody somebody that just does mostly like regular tv regular film but since you did have the chance to like cut your teeth doing like soaps, like I've talked to people, like when it comes to soaps, it is like, I, I don't want to say it's like military school, but you're really what like, very, it's very <laughs> regimented. Like, Hey, we want our summers off. We want to get out of here. So it was a lot of like, I talked to Sean Kanan and he was telling me like how quick it was. Like in the beginning, he was like, Oh my God, I don't think I could do this because everybody's so good and they know yeah. Like they know their lines, you know, they do. they're so good. Like I, when I was on it, they would fax you your, your, um, edits, anything that got cut, uh, lines that would get changed the day before, you know, you'd get your scripts a few days before, and then you'd get the faxes, although now they're emails. And, um, and I would just pray that like lines were cut, 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 you know, as the, it was, as, as it was coming out of the machine, I would just pray for the X's. <laughs> You know, because it's also what makes it a little bit easier is there's a lot of repetitiveness, you know. So on on Monday, you're telling, you know, your neighbor, yep, Johnny's a little sick. We're going to have to take him to the doctor. And we, you know, and then on Tuesday, then you'll tell the same story to, you know, the school teacher. Yeah, Johnny's a little sick, you know. So there, there was a repetitiveness. Um, yeah. But yeah, it is. It, it's a machine. And it what's great is it's very nine to five or seven to five. <sighs> You know, unless it's like some day where it's a big wedding or a big funeral or something. Otherwise, it's it's very very nine to five. It's a lovely, it's a lovely way to to make a living and and have a life. Yeah, yeah. And you have so many people that are in like horror sci fi that are end up on soaps for a lot. Like Kevin, yeah. Kevin was on for a long time. Yeah. Barbara Crampton was on it for a long time. Like, like so yeah. many people yeah. did Brad, all these you other like. Okay? You know, really? Red, Red, oh yeah, yeah, that's how he literally like still gets called back to General Hospital. Google right there the name Caesar Faison. That's his character, Caesar. Um, um, I think it's just C E S A R and then Faison, F A I S O N. And that character, um, like, yeah, I see it, yeah. Yeah, duration yeah. 90 to 92, 99 to 2000, 2012 to 2014, and yeah. then in 2018 they brought him back. Ni- first appearance was 1990. And um, <laughs> <laughs> um, he, uh, 
um, an actor named Michael Watson that was on General Hospital with him got the part of um, Stefan for Subspecies One, the the handsome half brother who the Michelle character falls in love with, and they were trying to find the monster. And um, and so Michael Watson was the one that said, "Hey, you should. Uh, I'm, I want you to meet my co-star on my soap opera." So well, that's how he. Wow, got it. that's yeah. really funny. Yeah, soaps you you're never dead, even if no. you might think you're dead. They're like they're like vampire films. We're also never they dead. Are. I know. With soaps, it's so funny. It's like, oh yeah, 15 years ago they died in a jet ski accident, but they've actually been still living and. And then they'll bring them back. It's so cool. <laughs> the otters <laughs> saved them. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so so just to go with the sequel theme more, I always say like Frog Town 2, then you had Subspecies 2. And then another really cool sequel, because I love Don the Dragon Wilson. I love Steve James. Uh, Blood Fist 5. Like, what uh, a funky movie. And I love <laughs> Steve James. That's like one of his last films now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just remembered him passing not long after that. It was such a no. surprise. He was not an old gentleman at all. Um, yeah, that was super fun. I mean, Don, Don was just, he's, we, we keep in touch, you know, like every other day on the Facebook. Cool. Um, it's so nice to keep in touch with someone like that. And he's just always so, he's just so complimentary and so uh, enthusiastic over everything I've, I've been doing. And, um, awesome. and he, um, uh, what was, um, oh, I have, I have a scene in that where I'm driving down Venice and it was a, a car driving scene and, and I'm driving him. I can't remember. Oh, I guess, I don't know. Um, I'm like hooker slash NSA agent and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and like you do. And so there's a camera mounted on my window and a camera mounted on his window for, you know, like blah, 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 blah. So <laughs> your car is extra wide, right? And um, and in the back seat is the the microphone script person. They, they lay down. And so you do a take and you've got um, a police escort as you're going down the street. You just get these police escorts. It's a lot of money. Um, it was Roger Corman films. So, you know, they didn't have tons of cash. So you get a certain amount of time. Yeah. So... Um, The director is on walkie talkie and the sound person's in, in there, or maybe he was in the back too with her. It was either on walkie or him. Um, So we, we did the scene and I'm supposed to go blah, blah, blah. No, you're blah, 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 no, blah, blah, blah. And then we, then I turn, I make a right turn and and then it's sort of one other line and it fades out. So we came back around and we do the scene again and we're going and the director says, do another take. So I, the light turns green or uh, as I was pulling up to it and I just kept going, but the cop <laughs> car in the motorcycle thought that I was going to be turning because that's what he saw the action was. So it's green and he thinks I'm turning right. So he starts turning and I'm going. So I wind up like, like he winds up T-boning oh. me and, and I'm, I'm in the middle of, of acting and I'm like, no, you're supposed what? Oh, oh shit. Oh shit. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> the, the sound guy actually at lunch let me put the, the headphones on me and let me hear the whole take. And then I, I get out of the car and the officer is like, are you okay? And I'm like, are you okay? Like I've never had a police officer apologize to me for me, you know, like ramming into him. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's like right in the beginning. That That's such a good move. It's always good whenever you see Steve James. Cause he's like a big time, like Canon film badass whether it be like the american ninja movies yeah. but it's always cool when he would be like like he's like at the jazz club in uh, weird science and then he's in weekend at bernie's too and i like seeing him in a role like this like totally different to to see him like that so now that you worked because i don't think you've talked to a lot of people that work for both like the bands and corman is there like a big difference in the way not saying how they would spend money, but yeah. See, another good question. Like no one's ever asked me that. Um, yeah, because because um, they're kind of one and the same. When you think about like right. that type of filmmaking, guy, right? Like you got yeah. that one dude, and he really 
um, craft the like like a little bit of a machine. You know, they just have this this studio machine. They do things for a lower budget. You know, Corman. I guess his stuff was. I mean, really, I guess the big difference was more in their genres. Corman's were a little yeah. more action, and Charlie's was a little more sci-fi fantasy. Right? Is that? I mean, you probably no. Know that's this right. Before. Yeah. No, they they tried to do different, and I have a couple of them. Oh, I have one of the movies right here. It's Which so one? funny because I was talking to a kid a few weeks ago uh, on his podcast because he was talking about like Full Moon. So I was like, I remember like this Full Moon. Scoot it like, over a bit. Oh, uh, scoot, scoot. Yeah. Oh, Pet Shop. Oh my god. So, so for like five years, they did. They had Moonbeam Entertainment. Which is like yeah. family movies. So they did like Prehysteria, which is actually a pretty yeah. good movie. Yeah. And th- they tried that. And then Corman did the same thing. Corman obviously had like the action movies, but he would like j- let Jim Wynorski do whatever type of horror movie. And then he would do the family. He had a bunch of family movies too that were pretty good. Yeah. One of uh, Jennifer Love's first, uh, Jennifer Love's you uh, its first movies was a Corman movie. Corman movie. Yeah. Yeah. The first Maybe. movie. Yeah. <laughs> But no, but that's interesting because those are two guys, one of the same, like, I wouldn't even put like a Lloyd Kaufman in that same realm because he's more of like really bootstraps, gorilla filmmaking. Hey, let's sleep on the floor. And then I'm sure he's making good money. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, no, the, the both Charlie and Ron, like you, you know, a lot of people, when I got that subspecies film, they're like, did you get paid? And I'm like, yeah, I was also at the William Morris agency at the time. And they made sure to collect our weekly checks because we were in Romania for three months shooting that. We shot part nice. two and part three back to back. They love um, Romania. During that era of uh, Full Moon, they were all over there for most of their movies they shot over there. Even ones that, like they did a movie called Oblivion around that yeah. time. And they were like, you know what? Fine. You know what? We'll go over there and build a Western set. And <laughs> Sam, the, uh, Sam Irv and the director, he was just over there. And the set's still there to this day. Oh, it's really? pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what's ridiculous, they used it in other shows and movies. So it was like this little dinky set. And he said, I forgot what, what show it was. It was actually a big name show, like a sci-fi show in the late 90s. They didn't change the <laughs> name of the bar, which was Miss Kitty's Bar. With Julie Newmar was in it. So they yeah. had her she made so many Catwoman puns in the movie, but her place was Miss Kitty's Saloon. And then they left that in maybe by accident or they just didn't want to change it or didn't think anybody noticed it. But uh, that's a cool uh, thing about filmmaking, especially like, you know, not only are you acting, you're working, you're seeing a country that not saying you never want to go to Romania. I don't want anybody that's Romanian listening to this and get upset with me, but it, that's cool that you have a reason to go there. Oh, 1000%, you know, and it it was super raw then it was, you know, we were, we had the sheep in the road and, and literally I'd have to get out and herd them out of the way or (laughs) we wouldn't have water because the water supply didn't make it over from Germany and the buildings were full of bullet holes from where the, you could see where, you know, Ceausescu was and his military shooting the people and, um, yeah, just little gypsy kids coming over and, and uh, finding ways to take your money. And um, <laughs> I know, but it, it, it was great because it was so gothically dark that it was easy to get into that world, you know, because for me, playing a character who turns into a vampire, I was like, well, I don't know. I don't have a lot of life experience with that, but I could imagine going across to another dark country and getting addicted to drugs, you know, and having some dude who's my pimp. And then my sister comes to see me and I'm, I'm completely horrified and embarrassed at this addiction that I have. And that made it easier um, or, or more human to play that, you know, you have to find a reason like a, you have to mentally go there, you know, like that's, that's like the name of the game for anything. Yeah. (laughs) So Denise, this has been great. What two more things I want to ask you? Uh, one is one movie that was that you were in. It's so funny. Sometimes there's these movies that, for some reason, they just don't get releases or like big releases that you know about. But I think it was was it wasn't. Inv- oh no, Invasion was a series. Was it Phoenix? 
One of these oh, movies yeah. had like Rebecca oh, yeah. Gayhart and Okay, Robin Cook's Invasion was a movie of the week. Oh, okay. Was, yeah, Robin Cook's Invasion. So that was an NBC movie of the week. Because okay. Because that yeah. director, um, um, Armand Mastrioani, he directed me in Northern Exposure. No, not Northern Exposure. Uh, um, Reasonable Doubts. Oh, cool. Um, he's this great Italian director, and he loved my what I did for him in Reasonable Doubts. And then when he did, um, yeah, he, I worked with him three times. Um, a movie of the week with, um, I don't even know if it's on my resume, um, with, um, oh God, I played the stenographer, um, Brooke Shields. Um, is there anything that you see in there with Brooke Shields? Um, and, what what year-ish? I, 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 uh, um, I was... There's Dark Vengeance. Oh, and Quinn, Quinn, Quinn. Oh God, Steve. Oh. Um. Anyway, he directed that, um, and then he directed this um, Robin Cook's Invasion, and I get to play this, um, uh, you know, waitress friend of of Rebecca Gay Hearts, and uh, and then I turn into you know. Um, I turn into a psycho and they, they were, they, <laughs> they, did a, um, uh, they did a special effect on the eyes. So they didn't put any contacts in, but they just said, you're going to go around to the back of the restaurant and then you do your scene, which is, you know, all of them are at the front, the rest are here with me. And then he said, and then hold, because they're going to, they're going to do a, um, a digital thing in post. And so since I had just come off of the vampire thing, I know that Ted, the director, just loved the vampire thing of the head down, eyes up. Like that was the thing. Like just having your head like that just wasn't as, um, it just didn't, the, the eyes weren't as strong as when you go down. He just liked the down. So when I yeah. got on the phone and I did the, although it was a old fashioned phone, I said, you know, <laughs> the others are around the front, but the rest are here with me. <laughs> and I did that thing. And when they, I heard him say, cut, oh, that's great, that's great. And then when I saw the final, like it was just this nice, still big eyes that they could do yeah. the post production in, you know? And um, yeah, like that's part, it's so fun knowing all the elements to making a film because it just helps you to do things better, you know? And part two at the end where I'm, where I'm being pulled by mummy the director wanted these shadows on the wall of the cave as the scene is playing out at the very end. And all you're seeing are the shadows of her hands. So I'm like making sure to dance them. And the director told me what to nice. do. Well, on this new exorcist film, um, I eat, I, I um, slit someone's throat and he comes to hug me basically to forgive me. You know, he's a priest and, and I'm like, get off of me, get, what, get, you know, and he's basically just trying to stop me from getting the other people. And so I use that same technique of the wall, <laughs> you know, and I've got my white eyes on and he's on top of me. And because I know how great and freaky that look, that movement, you know, as opposed to small hands, you know, yeah, yeah. it's just more, you know, so it's fun. It's the, the more you do, the more you watch it. And, you know, I don't watch it of like, oh, did I look good? Did I look pretty? No. Was I believable? Was I horrific? You know, that's it. Yeah, was so I you could take it and use it again all those years later. You knew that it worked on subspecies. So you're like, hey, let me do it when I'm doing it on invasion. All these things. That's cool. Um, no, it's always fun. You never like I would never have known about this show. Like, that's pretty neat. Oh yeah, yeah. And good people and then, like before, like Luke Perry. That was still on, right? Yeah, nine hundred two and was still on at in ninety seven. Yeah, of yeah. Course, oh, yeah. Okay. He was another sweetheart. He was also he liked matchmaking people. Wanted everyone to like. He did, you yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah, you know, they were all very happy. The the two of them, Rebecca and Luke, they were just like, you know, my husband was on tour with his band. He was on tour with them. Um, I think Matchbox 20 and I, we filmed that in Arizona and he coincidentally was in Arizona, his band Chalk Farm with Matchbox 20. And so after filming, I went there and so they were like, Oh my God, you're going to surprise your husband in a rock band. You're so in love, you know? And it's just, it was so oh. sweet to have these two celebrities just be so interested in me and my life, 
you know, and that's just the greatest thing about just, you know, the bigger the celebrity, so many times I've found them to be just even more interested in you. And, and that's, that's the best way to, to be in any scene is when you care more about your actor doing really well, you know, the, the, the co-actor in your scene, when you really want to make them look good, that's, that's when you'll look the best, you know? Yeah. No, that's great. Wait, your husband was a, in a band? Is he yeah. still in a band? Um, well, now he's in, he's in a, a different band called Rusty Truck. They actually just played um, the uh, Grand Ole Opry last month. Wow, and nice. Cheryl Crow uh, sang with them for two songs. Whoa. So that's cool. Is that how um, you met him? Like seeing him at, I, play in L.A.? No, I met him waitressing when I was 20 years old. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, in uh, Cafe 50s in Sherman Oaks. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Let me see. That's, where, where That's pretty cool. You were able to see him then. And what was the band that he was op like opening up for Matchbox 20? Yeah, his band was called Chalk Farm. Chalk Farm. Chalk Check Farm. him out. They had, they had a hit called Lie on Lie. That was like their big uh, MTV cool. hit. And uh, very yeah, cool. So I'll, on, uh, on airplanes. I'll check it out later. Oh, I see it. Michael Duff. Nice. Michael I'll have to check Duff. that out later. So, so Denise, here's my last question. I always like to ask people is obviously when you, when you're like in the moment, like when you're on your first set or in your first role, did you keep any like mementos? Obviously you mentioned you have your demolition man script, which is pretty cool. Uh -huh. Is there any other like keepsakes, <laughs> memorabilia, like wardrobe that you kept over the years? Um, I do have, and still wear after many years, I have a lot of my um, young and restless clothing. Nice. Um, she was a hippie chick and um, uh, the bloodstone was sort of lost. Um, and, um, oh, I, I see another good question. Um, I bought a lot of things when I was in Romania and I, I saved, um, like I bought plaques and I bought, um, and I wound up selling many of them at autograph conventions. Oh, cool. You know, a lot of artwork and stuff that I would bring in after, and just like just a few years ago. Um, but one thing that I've, that I've saved on the is, is I've always saved my fangs. I, I have my fangs from 1992. <laughs> They've cool. yellowed. And I have my fangs from the latest one. Sweet. From the latest one. So fangs, I guess that's the, I'm trying to think of other. Oh, I have my, con I've saved the contact lenses from this new demon film. Nice. The Exorcists. It's, it's Exorcist, but it's plural. And um, there's going to be like a big budgeted Exorcist film being filmed right now yeah what's his name's doing it uh is it david green uh david gordon green who did the halloween um, movies yeah i, I think, think he yeah. got those movies next yeah and so um asylum wanted to get in on that wave smart you know and and this is this is it's really great you know it's the same it's a young girl she's possessed it's in this you know um it all takes place in a church um yeah <laughs> So I saved my, my contact lenses from that. Nice. That's a smart uh -huh. thing to do. Asylum can look at like what Roger Corman would do, or I'm sure some of the Charlie band mm -hmm. movies were like, yeah. Hey, what's coming out next year in the trades? It's like, yeah. Oh, this movie about, it's like, all right, we're going to do that six months before. And then oh, sometimes yeah. it works, you know? And then, yeah, uh, yeah I think it's yeah. smart because people are like clicking around and, you know, Oh, I, I have the crazy high heels from, um, I wore them in the film I directed in the Vampire Resurrection. Oh, cool! But I got them, but they they were my heels in um, Blood Fist Five when she was like the hooker with those yeah, little yeah. You know, these. They were like funky wood with a velvet leopard thing, and um, I remembered I was supposed to do like this roundhouse kick, and I I remember practicing it. And my actress friend Julie Michaels, who's you know was in Roadhouse as an actress, and and she's a oh, stunt cool. too. Um, she trained me up on it and then i get to the set we went out to long beach and it was the big ending fight scene and then the director was like i don't want you like taking the last kick from you know like it's yeah. dawn the dragon wilson so it was yeah. like somehow i think i did something with a knife instead but i i practiced it in these crazy high heels doing this kick um, <laughs> but i think better that let dawn be 
Let Don have it, yeah. And awesome. I love those movies because in the first, before you even see like the name of the movie or anything, it says Don the Dragon Wilson, fourteen time champ. Like that's the first thing that comes up. But uh, uh <laughs> forget. <laughs> yes, yes. But uh so no, uh this has been great, Denise. I'm happy we connected and uh yeah, this was a lot of fun. And uh, I'm glad I asked you questions that you haven't heard yes. before because that's the worst. Uh, well, yes, maybe but not for you. Always, no, I know. You always have a great fast answer, but it, it's nice. I like my synapses to be snapped around in other directions. Yeah. Um, uh, trophy heads. Did you ever see trophy heads? No. Oh, no. Okay. No. Write that fucking thing down. Trophy okay. heads. So what Charlie did was he he took um, a bunch of his actresses from his films, like Brink Stevens and myself, nice. and and he kind of wrote. He wrote um, a uh, like real life storyline about characters we've played in a, in his films, and um, um, and and the writer took stuff from our real life, and so I play Denise. Every actor plays themselves, and we all one by one get kidnapped by a fan who puts us down in his basement, and um, so it's it's like five twelve minute little shorts. Cool. So each actress or two actresses. So I'm with this gal, Jack, Jacqueline Lavelle, Jackie Lavelle. Oh, and, I'm sure. No, for sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot the, um, anyway, but we got, we add, I ad libbed a bit on mine and, um, and I had said something about, you know, um, well, how many sequels have you done? You know, we had this sort of sequel yeah. thing, you know, and I'm like, well, I've never died in my sequels, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, when that you, come out, um, I think it came out maybe five years ago. Oh, cool. I got to check it out. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, um, I, it's, I probably get the most emails about that particular film being one of the funniest things that, that I've done. And, and it's cool. just, it was pure fun because I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm playing myself, you know, where she's like, we're trying to get out. And I'm like, I, I can't, I can't get it. It's carpal, carpal tunnel. And then I add, like, <laughs> you know, all the autographs I give, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's like actresses playing themselves um, with a with a, a fan who's trying to kidnap us. It's actually that's a, a good one. that's a good story. Yeah, that's a good yeah. idea. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for staying up late with me, Denise. It's been great oh, chatting, friend. and this will be out like next month. And uh, yeah, thanks for connecting us with Kevin. Kevin, uh, I got back. I got in touch with him. Good, good. Oh yeah, he's a fun time. He's a fun time. Lots of he seems stuff. like it because his email back to me, he he's he's very silly. Yeah, <laughs> he, very, he really is. And he, not, not saying people can't be spill, silly, but you like didn't expect it. And uh, yeah, his email back was like one long sentence underline. Like he's like, here's some questions for you. What what time? What day? Who's Denise? And like all these funny things. But uh, no, it'd be really cool. Cause he's done another guy. Like he's done so much. He was on soaps for a long time. It seems like yeah. everyone at, at one point gets on a soap, which is like a good thing. Cause it's a good gig and you learn a lot while you're doing it. All the above. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, make sure to have your Friday the 13th when you, because isn't that what he was in Friday the 13th? Yeah. Yeah. He was in Friday the 13th. Yeah. yeah. And he was yeah. in like Hills advised too. I, I didn't realize that until uh, I went, diving in his imdb yeah, and then, it's his sequel he is definitely yeah. uh, he's got all the fixings to be on your show <laughs> yes yes right, thank Jack, you denise it was great talking fun. to you nice to meet you bye-bye nice to meet you bye